Okay. So um, I'm going to introduce myself. So my name is Esti, and I'm one of the I am one of the consultants in the department, and I also have a special interest in teaching, and I'm busy with a degree in teaching called um, Health Professional a Master's in Health Professional Education, and. Um, I don't think it's a very well-known field. Before I started this, I was actually not even aware that it is actually an academic field. And um, it has been a very um, interesting journey for me so far. And I thought um, I would represent and sort of advertise it a little bit and just share um, some of the things that I've learned so far because I think we all have to be teachers, whether we want it or not. The only question is the quality of teaching that we provide. So, um, health professional education. So, it is a, it is a field ba uh, based on the evidence, um, uh, the evidence based policies and practices in medical education. It's about 50 years old and it includes multiple professions, not only medicine, also the allied health professions. So, for instance, in my class, there will be these nurses and um, so it's like a, an, an anatomy professors, and um, there's also people from private, the private sector, so lots of different people, not only medical education. And there's also a multitude of dedicated academic journals that I was also not aware of um, that only publishes in medical education. So lots of science around it as well. Um, very interesting to read, and it um, incorporates three sections. So it has to do, obviously, a lot with undergraduate teaching, also postgraduate teaching, like teaching like the registrar teaching, but then also an uh, aspect that I was unfamiliar with, but I found helpful for myself, and that is continuing professional development of established clinicians. So this idea that we are all, even if we are already clinicians or, or specialists, we should still be developing our teaching skills and our um, uh, repertoire of teaching methods. And then you can do a master's in health professional education. You can also do a doctorate in health professional education. So I'm going to talk a bit about the qualities of an excellent teacher, um, the challenges and common problems of clinical teaching, um, teaching in a clinical environment, and then I'm also going to introduce a teaching tool. Maybe some of you are familiar with it already. I was not. It's called the One Minute Preceptor. So first, I want to show you just a two-minute video of, I think this is uh, um, negative role modeling. Okay. Let me just see if I... Um, maybe I should... Okay, I hope you can hear. Is it who's there inside? Did you hear the bleeding time? 
Do what's the meaning time? The devil says so. <laughs> okay. So, um, this is just a. Oopsie, I think I pressed it. Okay, yeah. Uh, 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 uh. So, um, <laughs> okay, so that was just the introduction. Um, it's an old movie, and it just, um, I'm sure you can pick up many of the things not to do. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, uh, 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 characteristics of that as they've done studies and um, some of the characteristics of an excellent clinical teacher. So firstly, a passion for teaching, um, somebody that's organized and accessible, um, providing feedback, positive or negative, or uh, yeah, both feedback uh, uh, is actually very important. Um, the teacher themselves should demonstrate clinical competence. That is something that the student sees as important in the teacher. And they should possess a broad repertoire of teaching methods and um, them, they should themselves engage in self-evaluation and reflection on what they do and how they can improve on that. Challenges, challenges of clinical teaching, I think we are all very much aware of this, but I'm just going to go through it. Time pressures, regular interruptions. I myself find regular interruptions quite a specific um, problem because I often attempt to teach something and then I get interrupted and then I get disheartened. Um, competing demands. So. For us as consultants in the department, you have got pressure to do research, you've got pressure to, do, to um, become a better surgeon and to know lots of um, academics, but then also to be, you must know, you're expected to be a good teacher as well. Then increasing number of students is definitely a challenge. Um, clinical environment not being teacher, teaching friendly or teacher friendly. As you can see on the photo, we're all familiar with it. So big groups of students, small spaces, many patients, can't always see and hear what's going on. Multiple levels of learners, so that is for in instance on a ward run in labor ward, you will have a third year student, you will have a registrar, you will have an SI, and then you don't know always on what level to pitch it. And then patient related to, I must say, for me, I don't find patient relating issues such a big challenge for us. So I think in that regard, we are maybe privileged to have more um, patient cooperation and patient understanding for teaching, but often patients may be too ill or unwilling to be um, exposed to teaching. Um, and then lack of incentives and rewards for teaching. I think that is a, 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 apparently it's a universal issue, that it's not, reg uh, it's not seen in such high esteem compared to research and academic things that people do. So common problems with clinical teaching. So often students find that they, they, they don't know what is expected of them. Um, uh, we all tend to move towards asking students to recall facts and not focus on, the, on them developing problems, solving skills and attitudes, which is much more important. They can all go to a book or you know, go to their references and find the facts. It's more important to cultivate a way of thinking and a way of figuring out things so that they can figure it out for themselves in a constructive way versus just asking them, give me the five causes of this or the five complications of that. Pitched at wrong level, we often pitch things at a too high a level. Um, le uh, students are often passive observers and not active participants, and that also links with the time issue because often if you, it, it takes time to make them active participants, I would say. Um, it's not a battery. Okay. It is uh, Dr. Heinz's Apple computer, and he assures me that the battery will hold. Um, then another common problem with clinical teaching can be inadequate supervision and feedback. And then teaching by humiliation. I must say in our department, I feel that we um, are not uh, uh, teaching by humiliation um, often. So, but in some in, uh, departments and universities, I think it is absolutely the culture to teach by humiliation. And that is obviously a problem. And then lack of respect for privacy and dignity for patients is also a common problem with clinical teaching. Then I want to discuss a few tips and a few ideas around improving the way that you teach in all of these busy clinical environments. So the first one is very simple, and it's just be enthusiastic. I think if you're enthusiastic, you already um, have a big advantage uh, compared to somebody who's not enthusiastic, and that is something that most people should be able to hopefully get some enthusiasm going. Create a positive environment. So start with the basics. Treat the students professionally. Treat the patients with respect. Um, basic things like 
be on time, speak to the students properly, verbal consent of the patients. It's something that I'm working on because I haven't always been focusing on that and that idea of getting verbal consent for a vaginal ultrasound, getting verbal consent for a gynae examination and privacy. Um, we can't, cannot just assume that this, the, the patient must be um, happy with it. I think it's good just to mention that to them as well. Um, then an important uh, concept is that you should try in the clinical areas to do things or to teach in a way that you cannot teach in a classroom because this is a different environment with different advantages and time is not one of them. But um, even if you do small things that you cannot do in the classroom, it is something that is worthwhile for the students. So things like examining the patient um, yourself in front of the students and demonstrating the correct way to do it providing opportunities for correction of mistakes so that the student can do something, you tell them how to improve on it and then do it again in a better way. Um, show and explain clinical reasoning. So this again can be time, cons time consuming, but if you just choose one thing per patient and rather than talking about facts, 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 you rather say to them, um, how did you get to that conclusion and work a little bit on their reasoning? I think that's something that's also worthwhile to consider. Uh, explain how we apply theory, so that will be anatomy and physiology and um, things like that. And then real life examples in context of professional practice, so it's always good to link up things with your experience and um, uh, uh, I, I see that if I talk to students about and to registrars about and even colleagues about complications that has happened with patients that I've managed, people are always listening and their ears are open. So it's some people find that valuable to, to learn from other people's experiences. And um, also, example, uh, demonstrate to the students how to weigh up risks and benefits of procedures. And for, for instance, the preoperative round is a good example of that because it's a way of reasoning that they can develop. So make the implicit explicit. So implicit are things that are implied, but not actually, you know, people, you don't specifically say it. And explicit is something that's clear and there's no misunderstanding about it. So the idea is to think of things that we just assume the students will know and actually say it out loud to them, which is um, something that has also, also makes a, a big difference for students. So for instance, labeling the learning opportunities that arise in day-to-day -day work. So even saying to them, this is the Ghani clinic, it's very busy. But what you can learn here is, uh, we, I can demonstrate how to do a Ghani examination. Um, you can see how we cope in this busy clinical environment, how to highlight on specifically Ghani complaints, things like that. And if you just spend two minutes highlighting to them at the beginning of the day, what are the expectations and what they can learn, um, uh, uh, it is helpful. Otherwise, they just think they must just stand there and they don't know what they are supposed to learn. Um, signal expectations in terms of culture. So every t week I tell myself I'm going to actually type a little page to give to the students in the different clinical areas on what is expected of them because I always get irritated with them because they don't do the things that I want them to do. For instance, prepare the pap smear slide, do the thyroid and breast examination, wait, tell me once you want to present the patient to me, don't tell me repeatedly. And, and then it irritates me, but they also don't know what the, what the ground the rules or the... Uh, the expectations in terms of culture is. So I think to just tell them this is what is expected, just practical things. It also makes, um, makes it easier for them to cope in that busy environment. Um, be clear about the importance of learning from work and set aside time to consider lessons learned. So even once again, if you just highlight one thing out of a patient encounter um, and just sort of reflect on it for two minutes in front of them, that uh, is very helpful. Um, and also explain to them what you are role modeling and why. So something that was, uh, that helped me a lot that I learned when I went to a, a, a teaching course, um, when I started as a consultant, um, is that I always used to feel that there's a big responsibility on me to teach all the students many, many, many things in every clinical environment. And then they said, but that's not necessarily always possible, and it doesn't mean that you're not teaching them. So by telling them at the beginning of the day, so let's say lab ward is very busy or the clinic is very busy, I say to the students, listen, it's too busy for me to actually stand in front of you and teach and talk with you at the moment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to role model to you what, how to cope in this environment, how to speak to the different people that are involved, how to choose the sickest patient, how to speak to patients properly in a concise way. So just observe what I do, and I will teach by role modeling, but I cannot speak, speak to you and teach to you in the traditional way. And then I already feel, is everybody okay there? 
Okay, it's, it's the chair. Okay, I'm, I've got the post dramatic stuff. Um, um, so, um, what was I? Saying? Yeah, so I used to feel very stressed out always trying to talk and talk to the students and teach them, but I think if you say, say to them at the beginning, this is the situation, they also know what to do. They know that they can just observe you and that they should actually learn by observing what you do as well. And that has been something that's helped me a lot in, pra in practice. Manage in managing interruptions. While I was reading up for this talk, I found this um, a very um, nice thing um, that we already do, but it's good just to sort of say it out loud as well, and that you can tell students, listen, it's both your and my responsibility to close these um, teaching loops. So if you start teaching them about something that's important and you get interrupted, which you often do, it is both their responsibility and your responsibility to come, to come back to you and say, listen, we were talking about this, you were explaining this to us, can you please just finish this and get to sort of the take-home message and then finish that loop of conversation that you've had, and that's a way to have a ground rule about how to cope with all of these interruptions that we always get in the clinical environment. Then um, just a few um, uh, points on the problem of no time. So we obviously all struggle with that in our very busy clinical environment. So an important point is when time is not elastic, content is. So instead of trying to squeeze in everything, or I used to be like an all or nothing kind of mentality, so if there's no time to teach them a lot of things, then I would just sort of give up and just ignore them because it makes me stress so much. So it's better to rather than teach them one thing with a patient and keep the content to the minimum. They, uh, and and um, students can also not learn so much in any case in one day. <laughs> um, so to highlight what is important, focus on one skill or concept. Um, once again, the role modeling and thinking out loud. So to say, um, so this patient came in with this and this is what I considered and this is what I've decided and just at least then Verbalize what you are doing if there's no time to engage with them and, and sort of have time to have a whole figuring out session with them. Then you can at least verbalize how you are figuring it out. And then to grasp the unexpected teaching moment. So this is just to be open to the fact that there will be lots of um, uh, moments when things will happen that you did not expect that can be good teaching moments, especially with regards to ethical things and professionalism and maybe people now, the patient says to you unexpectedly she's a Jehovah's Witness or she says to you she doesn't want to be examined by a male or something. Just realize that this is a teaching moment for the students and just briefly debrief with them or tell them that this is something they can learn something from. Um, Right, and then lastly, it's not a very long talk. Lastly, I'm going to talk about this teaching tool, the one-minute preceptor. So I had to Google what preceptor means. So it means a teacher or instructor. So um, it is a tool for us to use in the clinical environment. I don't think it actually just takes one minute. It maybe takes a little bit longer, but um, uh, it's, it's a skill that you can use in different ways to, uh, uh, to sort of structure a bit of a teaching session with the students in a clinical environment. So it's quick, it can improve clinical care, and there are six steps, but the steps, the order of the steps are flexible, and you can also leave some of the steps out. Um, I'm just going to explain sort of the ideal stepwise approach, and this is the best studied of all the common clinical teaching tools that are available at the moment. So it, it includes six micro skills. It's not difficult skills, but it's important to understand them um, so that you can obviously practice it. So you should get a commitment. So this, you must now imagine you are at the clinic, um, or at, in labor ward and a student saw a patient and they're going to present the patient, complain to you or whatever. <clears throat> so the first thing is to get a commitment, uh, probe for supporting evidence, teach some general rule, and reinforce what was done right, correct mistakes, and then identify the next learning step. So I'm just going to briefly explain each of these six steps. So the first step, get a commitment. So the idea here is for you as a teacher to understand if the student can synthesize the information and give you a problem or a diagnosis that they are considering. And this you do by asking them some a specific type of question usually. So what do you think is wrong with the patient? So um, what I also realized when I did this talk is that I, due to time pressures, I often um, sort of uh, don't allow the student to, to demonstrate any kind of thinking process. I just sort of 
forcefully move things along because I'm, you know, I just want things to move along. So I think this is important that you must take one step back and just allow them also to speak a little bit. So um, questions will be like, what do you think is wrong with the patient? What do you think is the most important complaint to focus on during this visit? What would you like to accomplish on this, on this visit? I think especially the second one I think is maybe nice for the gynae clinic. What is the most important complaint? Because the students will often tell you all the 10 things that's got nothing to do with gynae. Um, I think it's important that they learn how to see a patient in a focused way at the clinic. So over-questioning and dominating the encounter, I think that's something that I do. People are different. So I, I see what they mean with that. To overly dominate the encounter is also not good for the students. Probe for supporting evidence. So here you obviously want to identify gaps in their knowledge or their way of reasoning out what is going on. So you will maybe ask them what supports your diagnosis, what other diagnosis would you consider, why would you choose this particular treatment or medication. And you also want them to speak out loud so you can hear how they're thinking. So teaching of general rules. So with this, you obviously want to close the gap that you have now identified in their way of thinking. So you want to teach a common take-home message or a patient care pull and um, maybe principles that you can apply to other circumstances and you must avoid anecdotes and peculiar examples. So I think on the one hand, you must tell people about things that happened to you, but you should also avoid telling a long story about something that's very peculiar and not really something that can be applied in general practice. And you can also skip the step if it's not applicable, so you don't have to find a pull if there's no pull to be found. Okay. Um, reinforce what was done right. So this is a bit of positive feedback. So once again, it can be one specific thing. It doesn't have to be a long thing, but avoid general comments like, this was a good presentation or you did a good job. Because a student, although they are flattered in the moment, they don't know what they did well, and they don't know how to do it well the next time. So they just think, okay, well, this person likes me or whatever, but it doesn't really help them. So it should be something specific that they did. So maybe you had a well-organized presentation, or you focused on the one main complaint, or you spoke nice, and sometimes if I can't find anything, then I would say, like, you spoke nice, I could hear what you were saying. You know, whatever, anything. Just don't give them only you know, negative feedback. You know we talk about the sandwich approach to feedback. I'm sure you all heard about the sandwich approach. So something positive, then you give them the negative or the or bow in the critique. What is that in English? Um, uh, constructive criticism, and then you end off with something positive. So it's a bit. I think it's a bit of a fake way to do it, but it is. And there is some truth in it. Okay, and this is also something you start with something positive. So reinforce what was done right. I'm sure something was done right. At least the student is there. Sometimes they even say to the student, "You look professional if they have a white coat on." I mean, find something. And then the next step is correct mistakes. So once again, you must also see what type of student it is. You shouldn't now, in front of everybody, if it's a very shy person, just consider maybe speaking a little bit to the side um, if time allows. And especially if it's some, something that you've spent a whole week with them in labor and you want to give feedback, maybe find a more private setting. Um, you can also ask the learner to critique their own performance first. So I think this is an interesting concept around feedback. Um, the only person that's ever done that with me is Kubis. <clears throat> so I thought I'll tell you this anecdote, for this peculiar story. Um, no, I'm just joking, is that um, when I did that gynae feedback with Kubis, he was the person that spent the most time on it with me. He actually gave me a pencil and he said, I must first give myself marks out of five, and then I must tell him why I give myself like a three or a two, and then he will tell me what he thinks I have, and then I, what I should get. And I thought this was so weird, and nobody's ever done that. And I didn't realize what it was about until later on when I read up about it. And I think um, the, 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 the point is it's very helpful for a student to first tell you what they think where they are. So you can also see, they give themselves five out of five, but they, they're actually a one, then you obviously know the problem is maybe there. And then it's also sometimes easier because if they give themselves a two and you also want to give them a two, then it's easier to say, I agree with your two. Why do you think you're a two? So it is actually very helpful. So um, uh, that is critiquing their own performance. So once again, avoid vague judgmental statements such as this whole case was handled badly because sometimes it's not very true and also it's not helpful because now it was or everything was handled badly what must I do I must just go home and cry and eat chips or what must I do so you must tell them how to improve the gaps you must tell them this is something you did wrong so they, so they talk about telling somebody what is where, where they should be where they are at and then how to get there 
And then the last step of feedback, actually to be true feedback, is that that person should accept it. Because if they think you're talking nonsense and they don't care what you're saying, it's not actually feedback because they're just going to throw it away. So it actually should be, this is where you should be, here's where you are, this is what you should do. Even if it's something simple, um, like you didn't tell me the HP, you should tell me the HP. Next time you must check the HP. <laughs> and then the person must be, oh yeah, HP is important. That's like a true feedback loop. Okay, it was a simple example, but just, yeah. Um, right, and then the last step is actually a newer step that they've added, and that's a, a, that they speak about identifying next learning steps. So that is, um, you will, for instance, say, okay, so this is now the answer, this is now what we're talking about, so what interesting aspect can we learn more about, and then maybe suggest uh, um, a source that they can use. And then another thing to also think about is there's nothing wrong with, I did pre-op rounds yesterday, and then the patient um, didn't look like she was thinking very deeply about what I, was, what I was saying. And then I said to her, ask a question. And then she said, she's got no questions. And then I said, oh, just ask one question because it's going to make me look good in front of the students. And then she said, okay. And then she said to me, please explain to me how, what is the origin of my home mass? Like how is it, why, where does it come from? And then I said to her, well, that's a very good question. And nobody knows the true answer. And then everybody was laughing. Nobody expected me to say, I don't know. So I think to say I don't know, maybe we're going to read about it, or there is no true answer, is also part of your teaching. It's nothing, you don't have to have all the answers. Okay. So now, at the, almost at the end of the talk, so I wanted to have two volunteers, because we're going to have just a short thing about demonstrating the six steps. Um, so I already had a volunteer in the corridor, so that is Dr. Heinz. So he's going to be the medical student. So now I want somebody more junior to be the consultant. Alzan, come here, you must. Sorry, Alzan, but you are just now sitting here in front. Um, so, but it's nothing stressful because you have a script. So you're just going to read the script. <laughs> so remember, he's the student, and she's the. So it's literally. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, so you are the you are the student. No, no, that's mine. So you are the student. But we must also be able to see the screen because I'm I'm going to bring the steps up as they present the steps. You don't have to stand that far away from the <laughs> from a consultant. And you, as a teacher, you obviously read everything that's in the blog. <laughs> So actually, there's any blockies. Yeah, there's any blockies. And then read it nice and loud that everybody can hear it. And then what I'm going to do, if you want to follow, I'm going to put the steps on as they demonstrate it. So you're going to see, get a commitment, pro for supporting evidence, teacher, yeah, 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 yeah. And then, um, you know, you can improvise as long as you don't um, uh, completely confuse everybody. Um, yeah, my husband suggested that I actually let you guys just do your own thing, but I said that might be a little bit too much for the first teaching session. Next time, if, you, if I have a, a follow-up, I'm going to allow people to, um, to, do, to demonstrate that they've learned what they needed to learn in the session. But for now, it's just a script. So, um, okay, so it's, it's just one and a half pages, and then we're done with the talk. Okay, good. Uh, good, good morning, Dr. Kulikvi. Um, I want to introduce you to, to Ms. X. Ms. X, this is Dr. Dr. Kulikvi. Um, and, and I'm going to tell Dr. Kulikvi about you. Um, th this is Ms. X. She's a 25-year-old female. Um, she complains uh, of her first episode of one day right lower abdominal pain. Uh, the pain was about 8 out of 10 in severity and she took paracetamol which didn't help. Uh, she, her eating is normally, she has no fever or chills, um, she has normal bowel movements, no nausea and vomiting. There's no surgical or medical history, she's never been pregnant, um, she has mild menstrual bleeding today, she's unsure about her last normal menstruation. Uh, she's not a smoker, she's not taking any alcohol or illicit drugs. She has a boyfriend, she uses condoms sometimes, uh, and she works at McDonald's and the BMI is 20. Um, morning, Mrs. X. I'm just going to speak a little bit to our students here today, um, and then they'll tell me a little bit what, about the plan that we're going to make for you today. Um, so you can tell me your name, student, since uh, I, I see there's no... Uh, I'm Mr. Van 
Ada So tell me, um, what do you think is going on with Mrs. X today? Well, I, I think she has irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, why do you think this? And what else can you consider as a differential? Well, I thought it could be a bowel since she works at McDonald's. And she, doesn't <laughs> have, <laughs> she doesn't have a fever. Uh, but it be appendicitis since the pain is in the lower uh, right uh, quadrant. Uh, but Maybe it could also be an ectopic pregnancy. Okay, so this patient reports being sexually active without any uh, reliable contraception. An ectopic is the most dangerous differential and must be ruled out in any female with lower abdominal pain that is sexually active. In fact, any woman of reproductive age with abdominal or pelvic complaints should undergo a pregnancy test as part of your workup. Mm. I am, uh, I am glad ectopic pregnancy. I'm glad, I'm glad. I am glad. Ectopic pregnancy made your differential, Mr. Um, it could be catastrophic to miss. Um, with just a simple sexual history, you identify that this patient is at risk for an ectopic pregnancy. Um, IBS is a common uh, diagnosis, but it's not likely to present this um, acutely without previous history of similar events. You correctly identified that appendicitis was less likely, giving her lack of anorexia and fever. And I would like you to read up about IBS and its presentation. Uh, the prescribed surgical textbook is a good resource. And maybe next time, that in your. That's one of the correct mistakes. Okay, so did everybody follow the steps? I mean, this is a simple sort of example. Um, and then I would like to just end off with two quotes. The first one is, education is what survives when what has been learned has been forgotten. And the second one is, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And some of the references, and I hope you all learned something new that you can go and use. Questions in. Must I have questions? Okay. Um, any questions? I don't think it's very question. What's your thesis? So that's a good question. <laughs> so I'm going to briefly. Um, it's good you tell me that I can advertise it amongst the registrars. So I feel that our obstetric um, evaluation, so continuous evaluation or formative assessment in that two years is not optimal. And this, the registrars are not aware of where they should be and what they should do to get there. And um, the method that we use, due to all of our, obviously it, it's because we don't have enough time and all of that, but I want to sort of delve a little bit deeper into that and see if I can improve the way that we give formative assessment, so continuous assessment and feedback to the registrars, especially during the obstetric rotations. Yeah, so I'm going to do a... Um, start with a qualitative thing just to see how everybody feels about it and how they feel it can be improved and then I'm going to um, incorporate that into a practical way of doing it. I think it's okay in Guyane because you're with a, register, uh, with a consultant for three months and you have a relationship with them. But I think doing the obstetric block, people are hanging around and they don't have um, sort of uh, clear guidelines on how to improve and what they are doing and how they are comparing to where they should be. Hmm. Okay, any other questions? Yes, Dr. Reins. Okay, I don't know if this is on. I'm yeah, okay. It's just for Billy's sake. Okay. Um, I, I'm glad you touched on the fact that we work in a busy environment and, and we often use that as an excuse not to involve the students and not to teach them. And I'm glad you also gave the solution to say the most important aspect of your teaching is modeling. So mm. if, if you can't speak to them, mm. take 10 or 15 minutes to speak to them about a problem. Just tell them, listen, stick to me and watch what I do. Mm. Uh, because that's a very, a very strong Powerful. Uh, tool of teaching. Mm. Yes, true. Thank you for that. Any other comments or questions? Okay, are we going to take a break or Dr. Reins is going to continue? If there's no rep 
And I think we can maybe just stretch our legs and then continue. Okay, good.